So um, welcome back. I hope you had a good lunch. Yeah, good. And um, always the challenge after lunch is... <laughs> so I, I don't really... Yes, exactly. And I'm, you know what, it's going to happen. So just let it all wash over you, okay? Every now and then I might ask some questions to try and, and uh, stop us from going too deep into the, tr the, the black trough, as they call it, you know, the, the time that uh, things drop off. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> the second objective was uh, for, for today's um, lectures was to, to develop entrepreneurial skills, harnessing creativity and innovation in strategic use of experience, design, uh, analysis, social media content and strategy. You know, use of micro video. We're not going to cover all of these things, okay? What, what, what I suppose I'm trying to say with that objective is if we had a, you know, a whole semester to unpack, these would be the things that we would focus on, probably at least you know, one, one lecture per thing. I may have as little as one slide per thing, but I'm going to focus more on those that I feel that are, are most interesting, okay? Um, <coughs> and those that I feel maybe um, some of you may have more experience with than others, but that I feel are sort of very current, okay? So, um, digital marketing, okay, essentially, um, arguably, um, what, say, for example, the context of an app for an event, it, it falls within that remit. Okay, um, it may be a little more operational use, use of an app, um, but it could also be the, the way to buy the tickets, could also be the way to connect to different social media. So it's interesting to look at it in the context of the wider challenge of digital marketing. And this slide is, it sort of takes advantage of uh, like a context like the London Underground, okay? and tweaks it to kind of give some insight into just the, the range of different challenges that come with an integrated marketing um, approach, okay? So we don't have time to unpack all of those, but we do have time to be aware of some of the more important ones uh, and those which, which are going to impact on a, on, a, on a visitor experience. So we'll look at some of those as, as we move through. So what is a multi-channel approach? Would anybody like to hazard a guess at what we're discussing there? So we're talking about marketing with the digital focus. So it could be social media. What else could be integrated into that from a marketing perspective? Okay, so email newsletters, even maybe a physical newsletter could arguably be part, well, should be, if you use them. E-commerce, e good. <coughs> Possibly um, other platforms, you know, you're seeing now, you know, within TripAdvisor, you can book an Uber, for example. So you're going to see that sort of cross-pollination of platforms as well. But um, <coughs> Chaffee, uh, in the book Chaffee and Ellis Chadwick, Okay, um, they present customer communications and product distribution are supported or driven by a combination of digital channels and traditional channels at different points in the buying cycle. So we looked earlier at, at, a, at a buying cycle and where AI and other technologies and, and modeling and so forth impact. Um, and it, it is a mixture of digital and, and physical marketing material. So um, effectively for say uh, any context, say let's take a, a destination, okay? So a destination usually is going to have a core website, okay? Um, why? Well, it's somewhere to house important information and then to track its impact, yeah? Without your own core website, it's, it's a bigger challenge to manage that. You're, you're probably giving away a lot of that. So although you can, small, very small businesses can operate without a website um, and often do, certainly in the tourism field, um, obviously uh, generally having a core website is 
probably one of the more fundamental things in this period. Some of the other channels, obviously we've got a block there for social media, an ever-expanding uh, block. I put in smartphone apps more for today's context. We have uh, print media still impactful and used. And also blended, uh, you're seeing some contexts where uh, print and you know augmented are kind of uh, blending. <coughs> and email marketing is still a very powerful, it's probably the most powerful uh, tool for marketers. As difficult as it is to get you know, that um, impact in someone's inbox, you know, when you look at Google uh, or Gmail, you know, the filters are much better now. Um, but if you've got a, an ongoing relationship with that uh, client, then it's still the most powerful uh, and potent means and cheapest and most effective of uh, c communicating your marketing message. And television and radio is still, is still there, yeah? Um, obviously changing. But what about, um, it comes in a bit like the Pac-Man there, voice. You know, voice search in its own right. You know, how's it going to impact all of that? So you do all of this really hard work, right? You've got your, you've got your, your website. You know, you've got, you've got a social media profile across six accounts. You know, you're creating all of this content for that. You know, you've got a great app. You've got this, that, and the other. And then voice search comes along. And Comscore predicted that by 2020, 50% of searches will be through voice. How is that changing, you know, the landscape of, of marketing or search for um, product ideas? You know, the main thing, it sort of silos searches. What happens is you've got these ecosystems of uh, voice search. So Alexa is selfishly aligned to Amazon and therefore it's going to have a narrowing effect on your search, right? It's going to prioritize things that, that it can get. Um, and because it's voice, you know, it's not like it can serve you several options, yeah? Now, there may be other ways that that platform may, may evolve to give you, but it's still, it takes this amount of time to present that information to you through voice, you know, the return. Whereas on a website, well, I, I can see seven possibilities in my first look on a Google page, for example. So voice search is going to have a significant impact as we go forward if, if it is adopted at the rates that it's being adopted. And I'm going to show you some of those rates in a minute in some slides because I think it's interesting to see how, how it is impacting. But um, traditional marketing and Arguably, to some degree, you know, going forward, digital marketing is, is, is not, you know, as effective. Certainly traditional isn't. We know that. But digital media is becoming the most effective and efficient method, but it has its challenges because we have new platforms coming along which are, are siloing, you know, our, our information searches. And there are huge mistakes being made along the way in terms of um, how people design uh, their marketing message and how they, they, um, they put it out there. And it's costly. So um, some studies suggest up to 80% of online marketing fails to reach its intended audience. 80%, you know, that's quite a sizable, sizable market. So what's clearly happening is a bit of a scattergun approach, yeah? Um, if 80% of marketing, now is that because, um, you know, strategically, SMEs are toying with the digital, you know, maybe less strategic about it and just trying things and therefore the data is relating about 80% of a miss rate. It's certainly something that, um, that's costly and for businesses to survive going forward, it's going to be something that they'll have to, have to um, acknowledge. So multi-channel hopefully would reduce, but again, it takes much more time and has to be well structured and planned and, and, and critically very well measured. Um, so, and, hmm? Can I just go back to why, why do you think, I don't know, maybe I help me understand why uh, about 
percent of the online market fails to reach the target audience? So if you think of some of the um, targeting that has been going on on Facebook, for example. So I target, uh, I have a, a Titanic product and I realize that there's a large population in Chicago that are learning about that at school at that, that period. And I, I target that area um, and I look at a demographic and so on. You know, I'm going into much more detail and I've got more strategy, but a lot of businesses aren't. A lot of businesses are just going, I have X amount of budget and I'm not contextualizing well enough. So SMEs, due to the resource, you know, you're talking about an owner manager, for example, on, his, on their own, trying to kind of like come up with solutions uh, to using platforms possibly for the first time. So it's skewed. The data would be skewed more towards those that have less familiarity probably with the platforms. But that's the reality of, you know, if you look at the ad spend, you know, that's the reality of your user groups. And then you've got, the, the, you know, agencies and other groups that are maybe a little more targeted because they just, they're spending more and they're learning more. Does that make sense? Has that helped? Ish? A wee bit. Okay. So um, in terms of, you know, how, how to, to maximize that then in terms of, uh, like it's absolutely critical to start to, 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 to dive into who your customers are. Um, and obviously digital gives you that opportunity where physical marketing really without surveys or focus groups, you weren't really able to find out too much about them. Does that make sense? So obviously the me metrics we have, the behavioral stuff sitting behind Facebook alone, you know, um, can really open, open up your, your eyes to who your market is and how you can target them. So um, are any of you working in contexts where you're currently digitally marketing? I, and what's that context? Okay. So on social media, right. And um, so that's for the master's course you're yeah. doing that? So okay. Mm -hmm. Similar, similar characteristics or behaviors, or and do you do you do they spend money on advertising, or is it just um, actually yeah. driven by your own content and engaging customers? So we actually did it just two times last year when we have um, like the career open days at university. So Literally just to try it. Yeah. Okay. But actually we saw that since like this April, all the same kind of posts and content, they had a drastical different kind of engagement because of the what the algorithm the algorithm is doing inside Facebook. Mm. Right. And it dropped off yeah, the dropped engagement. Off. Yeah. So it's a all of these platforms are pay to play nearly now, right? The only one at the minute that you can get reasonable traction for your videos and your content and it for now is LinkedIn. It's still offering businesses and individuals a, 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 you know, that type of engagement that you were getting on Facebook. But that's not going to be forever. Where the next one is that you'll get that, that's where creative marketers are going to kind of, you know, but you know, again, who are the user groups of those platforms? Do they match really what your objectives are? And that's why I think that it's a critical that a, d a digital budget is available because it's a lot of energy to create good content. And, and if it's literally just hiding behind a screen because you won't pay to, to do that, you know, it's, 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 it's a tough thing. So more importantly, when you do serve ads to a wider uh, it's like serving a survey to a wider audience. Essentially, you get more data back. You're going to have a better chance of building better profiles, personas of your user groups, and therefore um, have a much more targeted approach and not be one of those 80% you know, statistics. Yeah. Um, so uh, obviously critical to, to what, what, you know, what, are the, what are the key kind of, what is their voice, you know, 
obviously there's like the the language itself, but then there's the kind of the subtleties and the nuances of of those languages spoken intergenerationally, you know, um, or subgroups, or you know, for example, in the road racing context, the the event app, you know, if you didn't kind of no road racing, you know, they use a lot of terminology that you, you wouldn't be familiar with, right? So pretty much every context has its own has its own tribe and its own kind of user group, right? So, you know, that's going to be critical. And and their channels of choice. So again, um, quite a quite a wide variety of, of channels. And we've spoke of some of them and we're going to go into some more detail on those um, now. But critically, if you combine them effectively, then you're not going to be one of those statistics. I do, though, believe that it is important to spend a little, just because you get that look inside to see, actually, a little more of the data potential behind, say, some of the platforms. You know, you can learn a bit more even just in that process. Um, we did talk about micro video at the start and the power of, we talked uh, this morning about Instagram and the power of, of, uh, of, of visuals. You know, and how that's uh, uh, critical. Well, there's an interesting statistic here from uh, Skift. 71% um, of travels look to video for vacation ideas. I mean, how does that stack with your own experience? Do you find you look in that inspiration stage pre-travel? How much of that is... Yes. Like three or four places, and you can either go online, look a little bit around. Um, a lot of um, the online travel guides or something, they post videos and things every day. For example, on Facebook, you get like today we present this is a country or mm -hmm. this is a city. Um, go there, it's amazing, and they show you quickly, like in 30 seconds, the most, uh, the most ex important things to see. Mm -hmm. then to make decisions where to go when you have your so you feel yeah when you're at that point where you're going look I'm, I'm it's either here or here mm -hmm. and I really want to kind of just dial in a bit further yeah. okay I would say um, well I know certainly in my own experience this summer looking at um, a place in Portugal I had got down to that sort of level of kind of um, you know this beach versus that area or whatever um, critically it's how these are designed and how they're shared um, you know, there's, there's um, <coughs> like video <coughs> to make it and to make it well is not is not cheap at, at one level, and yet there is a bit of a formula there that if you if you know how to kind of you know lock off your camera so it's not kind of wobbling about, and there's, you know it can be done very effectively and authentically. We talked about this authenticity issue, you know, in tourism or challenge, you know. Um, People who are there visiting can often give you that content as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, we're not going to focus too much on video for the context that we're looking at, but it is something that is obviously quite powerful. So we're just going to do a little uh, task, another one. Um, this time, just in pairs, okay? Um, and I want you to identify three key channels that you think would be required to promote the enter 19 conference, okay, uh, to members of the IFIC community and, and around them, okay, people that could potentially be uh, interested in that event, okay? So just take, take a moment or two and have, say, a couple of minutes, five minutes with, with uh, a partner and, or threes if you have to, or whatever way your numbers are set up. And think of the top three channels for the IFIT Enter 19 conference. Um, we'll move on then, those are great ideas. Um, we, we saw that we had a mixture of variety there really, didn't we? You know, um, which is unsurprising really, given the, the nature of the, of, the, of the customer really, you know. So those were, those were good examples and good contextualization and hopefully help to stop you going completely to sleep at this uh, post-lunch period. <coughs> so, Chaffee 
highlighted that it's ultimately about reaching the right customer using the right channel with the right message or offering at the right time. And what's interesting about that is the more and more digital we use, the bigger trace we're leaving, the more we're open to being interrupted with notifications. So um, that's also a context that during trip, you know, that, that the, the app opens up is this idea that, um, you know, whether it's on your location. So I fly into Cyprus inside this geo area and the app triggers to welcome me to iFit 2019, okay? Are there other contexts where that might, it might be a certain time of the day? The app triggers to say, don't forget the um, evening, uh, you know, event um, and the, you know, whatever the entertainment is around that or, you know, so l lots of opportunities for the geo and the t so time based and location based and the mixture of those. So that's quite interesting. And obviously websites are now starting to do that sort of two way. If, you, if someone doesn't have the app, sometimes you, you know, you've given the website permission to, to do that sort of notification as well. So basically, in utilizing the multi-channel approach, what we're trying to create is shared value, okay? So, um, and sometimes less is, less is more really, isn't it? I mean, I don't know if you find that, you know, you're losing some communications because you're working across too many platforms, you know, and in, in an era where we have <laughs> like more ways to communicate, we're missing more messages, right? So critical that your strategy kind of allows for that. We talked about this whole idea of co-creation um, at the start, and I think it's, it's something that's important to kind of bring in, in terms of the narrative. And we go back to Vargo and Lush, who um, you know, look at these ideas of service ecosystems, which your digital app and experience sits within. So how, who are the actors involved in this event? We've, we've, we've targeted some of them. So we've got the consumer of the event, but who are the other actors? Who might the other actors in the event be? So the organizing committee of the, I know what you mean, the sort of the um, nearly like a gr ground handling or conference management team. Yeah, good. Accommodation providers. Maybe excursions, excursions <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Ex outside caterer coming in. Absolutely. Um, you know, so many primary and secondary stakeholders yeah, and, and supplier stakeholders or organizational stakeholders or, um, you know, customer stakeholder groups and the variety in that. So that's what I want you to be thinking about around this event app. Who could plug into this ecosystem, right? Who can add value? So one example from TripAdvisor is how they work with Uber, you know, and that works quite well in some context, and also booking.com, I think they, you know, so any of those, think of the, the context around an event um, or a conference that you can kind of plug in, and other resources that can integrate. So what, what other resources might integrate? So you've got your own devices, which is the main integration from a consumer perspective. You could potentially have weather data, you know, various other kind of um, content, really, you know, that integrates. Um, <coughs> and we're just looking for enablement where it's value, value adding or increasing, right? So that's kind of critical. So there's some great work um, to try and unpack that a little. It is, um, it is the context of sitting within this, the service ecosystem. You know, all of these other parts, this kind of idea of, of the many 
to many co-creating together, you know. Um, and it doesn't always work perfectly, but platforms kind of enable that, right? So my own research, um, one of the outcomes was looking at mobile um, as an acronym, again, um, and the idea of the mediating role of ICT, the operational impacts that it has on the organization. You know, this framework was to try and help you think about when you apply, you know, a new app or a new ICT, you know, what were the, what were the outcomes? Um, you know, the behavioral impacts, you know, wh what's it changing? Is it taking away from the experience and the authenticity that you talked about? Or, you know, every, every experience is different. Sometimes it can add to it because it could be, a, uh, you know, a technology experience. Insights and analytics, you know, what, what are you getting out of it in terms of information and how can you improve the system? And, and obviously the location and context and all within the experience scape. So just pushing on, as we said about the um, insights and analytics, you know, that's a, just a, a constant stream of data um, being created, yeah, particularly with the app ecosystems. And how um, we describe that, so Chaffee offers it as a massive volume of structured and unstructured data that's so large or complex, it's difficult to process and analyze using traditional database techniques. So that's why data scientists are in such high demand and the skills to be able to write programs, as Rudy rightly pointed out yesterday, are in such high demand and well worth investing time in, because they are totally impacting on, on, uh, on how we, how we build experiences. So the, a little more on the idea behind it, um, this digital trace that we all leave, you know, being able to to, to go into that kind of uh, micro level and be able to to to, to really, uh, basically. Uh, gain insights into that individual and personalize their experience around their location, their context, um, and their particular needs. And we know the, the, the scale of, um, of data being created is quite phenomenal. And we consider that amount is quite a sizable sum of data. So I'm going on to the next part, which I think is quite important for um, apps in particular, but just in general, okay? Um, so voice. So according to uh, Don Brunn, Public Relations Senior Manager at Ana Amazon, they believe that voice is the most natural user interface and can really improve the way people interact with technology. You could also argue that layered on top of, uh, you know, facial recognition at some point, you know, that's going to be a whole other, but too complex maybe, um, you know, to, to, to kind of actually roll out at the minute, but worth considering. Um, so, have you, s I'm just going to put this on, just, um, you've probably seen this, but is there audio on the? I actually don't know if that'll play anyway for it. Maybe that won't play there. I don't know if that plays. Is there a way that you have to? <coughs> is the video implemented or is it just a link? Uh, it's implemented. That's probably why. No. I'll, I'll find the link and come back to it. Not to worry. Um, the links, it'll be in the slide. It's just the, the, the Google Assistant earlier this year, um, which rang to make a, a, either a restaurant appointment or a hair appointment, oh, yeah. which I can't remember which one I plugged in. Um, but just this idea that, you know, voice being used by artificial intelligence, it's quite a striking conversation to listen into. It is quite a step change in how things are done. And I think it's worthwhile, hopefully I can get it, um, working for you at a, at a later stage, but to have a, have a view of that particular video in terms of the service interaction. So in terms of um, voice and voice search, we've got 20% um, are already using smart speakers in the US. So that's quite, quite, quite a high number, but as I said, by 2020, Comscore predict that 50% of all searches will be done by voice. So we can see the... Um, 
the kind of the spread of, of, of user, but it is. Hands up who has a, a voice operated app or device. So some have, yeah. Um, if we look at the, the, the key players over this little period, we can see that um, obviously Amazon, you know, ha are kind of running in a, a bit of a lead here um, within with Alexa and in the use of um, directing people really to buy products quite quickly. Um, but Google is, is really making inroads there. And it'll be interesting to see. Google tends to be a more open platform generally, and Amazon more likely to be a little more siloed. So it's good that that pressure's there to sort of um, develop and to see what, what comes. So Google is eating away at that um, monopoly and has already reached a market share of 25%. And a lot of that's, like the, the growth of this as a technology, a lot of it's down again because the, the price, the price point has got to a point where, you know, the convenience of using it, it's, it's kind of worth taking the risk, right? It's, at, um, at $39, it's not going to make you think, oh, I won't, uh, I won't purchase. But obviously, there are some more expensive platforms. Critically, the API is opening these platforms up. You know, how is that going to uh, change experiences and particularly um, tourism and events? So what we see people are actually using them for. Um, so general questions, about 60% of the, of the activities. Weather, 57%. Um, streaming music, timers, alarms, reminders, calendars. And you know the statistic view ordering products and ordering food services, the revenue relevant usage, but and I know they're being very, very specific and focused there, but um, you know there are obviously there are steps to the point that you're going to be if you're finding a local business, there's a good chance you're going to be spending some money, right? So another little task. Um, if you get into your your groups again, okay. Um, I want you to identify three key impacts that voice search will have on hospitality, tourism, and events, okay? So what three impacts, key ones, do you think that voice search will have on hospitality, tourism, and events in your groups A, B, C, D, and E? Okay, so um, just in terms of a little more on the, on the voice, so Amazon's Alexa has more than 30,000 skills, many focusing on games and education. So these are the, the, the things that you can um, you know, unlock, if you like, through um, the voice. Okay. Um, is it surprising that 25% are games, trivia, and accessories? Not really. When you look at an average TV and you flick through the channels, you know, like <laughs> most of it is... is trivia, you know, less significant stuff, you know, human beings by their nature a lot. It's, it's um, just some de fun, relaxing thing to do, okay? <laughs> Education and references is a good one. Um, but, you know, productivity only 5%, you know, you would have thought that um, ordering, ordering your, your food and goods, it's productive at one level and probably not productive at another in terms of your community and your shops and various things. So 27% of Google Assistant apps focus on games and fun. Okay, that's quite a high percentage. But it gives you some context for how they're being used, okay? And I think that's important in terms of where you think that, where the next impact's going to come. So um, with tourism, you know, gamification has been talked about. Lots of papers, Pokemon Go, uh, Aria, who um, is the president, did a really interesting piece on that. Um, what's voice going to bring to that gamification, you know? Um, obviously, education and references is a significant opportunity. You know, you're at a site, you are interested in more information, there isn't a guide available. You know, that two-way flow of, of the interactive experience. Um, room control in your 
in your um, your hotel room, yeah, you know, the temperature, the you know, you, like that. That's obviously going to be another one that will impact potentially because you're looking to personalize your home. Maybe you have home settings, you know. Can your home settings be somewhat reflected in your room settings, you know, so that you sleep better or that you feel more comfortable away from home? So, and we see here Google Out Assistant outperforms competitors in all categories in terms of correctly answered queries. Um, so those are all good strong metrics really probably for Google, aren't they, in a way, you know, but they've got more, they've got a bigger harvest of data. They've got a bigger program of uh, machine learning as well. And AI is working away. So, um, but certainly in terms of um, the location-based and navigation, it's unsurprising really that Google would be so strong in those because we rely on them so heavily for those tasks. So, more than 50% of smart speaker owners would appreciate the technology also in other situations. So, again, in the tourism context, what about the the vehicle? You know, um, <laughs> when you're sort of panicking about, you know, getting the information in, you know, the, the postcode of where you're supposed to be staying that night into the sat-nav as you're driving, you know, like voice is going to obviously support some of these tasks. Um, so that's some other, other elements. I'm not going to spend, I just wanted to touch on those because I thought it would be interesting to look at that one context. If 50% of voice searches, or 50% of searches on the internet are proposed to be by voice by 2020, that's not insignificant, yeah? 